Okay, guys, welcome to the part two of Healthy at Home webinar series. These webinars are designed to give you an easier time through this difficult period by focusing on your health. I think now is really the time that we can think about things like how we live our every day and the habits that we, that we go forth and take because it's those habits that ultimately lead to a state of health or disease. And it really is a, a simple case of momentum and healthy habits that lead us to a, to a better state. And um, I couldn't think of a better topic to talk about. This is one of my favorites to talk about than stress and hormones. Both are interconnected and both uh, feed into each other. Stress will affect hormones, hormones will affect stress. So what we're gonna go through today, uh, a little, well, we'll go through a little bit of stress physiology so you have an understanding of, what, what, understanding of what is happening in the body when we perceive something as stressful, and it is all about perception. And then we'll talk about the hormones that are associated with it, and you will learn how we can manage stress and also manage your hormones, and also work out, hey, what might be happening if the hormones are out of balance. So, Let's talk stress to start off with. So um, there is a breath exercise. I'm gonna save that one for later on though. But one thing we wanna talk about is the nervous system, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Now you might've heard of these before. There's two nervous systems that primarily two nervous systems that make up the body. First one, sympathetic nervous system. So think of this as like fight or flight, punch and run. When we go through a stressful situation, we are flooded with, central, with sympathetic nervous system activity from the central nervous system, and that helps us get through situations. It'll help draw blood from the heart into the limbs so that you can, well, punch and run, fight or flight, and deal with what's going on. Think of like the, the best example of sympathetic nervous system is when we're being chased uh, through the savannah by a tiger. And um, that's really where the central nervous system is developed, it's developed to, to help us through these stressful situations. Like anything, there's positive and negatives towards it though, and we're gonna talk more about that at a later time. The parasympathetic state, so this is where we talk about uh, rest and digest, feed and breed. This is where our heartbeat slows, we enhance digestion, we can sleep, we have a, uh, I don't know, I've got a better photo of Paris. There we go, parasympathetic, that's much better. So we chase down the animal and then we are resting and digesting that thing after we've had a good feed. Uh, the best way to look at nervous system is in action is to look at animals. Like they spend a the bulk of the time in this parasympathetic zone. They're not really doing a hell of a lot, but when the time has come to really use that energy that is stored, they're, they're ripe and ready to go. And that's really the beauty about watching these beautiful creatures. They are, they are always, uh, they usually, you rarely, rarely find if you go through a, 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 a safari in Africa, I went there a few years ago, it's rare that you find that animals actually doing anything. They're usually just hanging out and, um, and just waiting for that moment. But when that moment comes, they are definitely ready for it. The comparison between the two guys, uh, parasympathetic here, sympathetic over here, the, the parasympathetic, this is where the body does a lot of its uh, mending and, um, and, and, and digesting and fixing and, and all the things that it needs to do to keep going. That's when we're in a rested state. So sleep is so important as well. That's when we actually do this work. Sympathetic is when we are, uh, when we're doing stuff, when we're exercising, when we are working, I have a, par a sympathetic nervous system now. My parasympathetic response I want to happen at night time. And really, I think it's a, a skill in itself is to alternate between the two nervous systems and have tricks or, um, or exercises to do it. Because if you're parasympathetic the whole time, you'll be lethargic. If you're sympathetic the whole time, it's a high, high state of anxiety. And uh, if we balance the two, that's when we can really do some good work. The problem is though, that everything's sympathetic dominant these days. We are faced with an unbelievable amount of stress, like never before in human history have we had this much stimulation and stress. Uh, I showed this slide to somebody uh, once and they said, this slide is stressful. <laughs> and they're completely right. Like it is a stressful sight to look at colors and motion and lots of people and 
coffee and <laughs> everything here is 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 it, it drives a stress response so yeah these in itself aren't bad but when we're flooded with them from from by the time we wake up to the time we go to bed it's no wonder that we're having a lot of stress related disease let's look at stress uh, stress is think of it like change change in the body but those changes can be physical mental and emotional so stress is not just say having a fight with somebody or it's not just uh, getting cut off in traffic stress can be the process you go through through physical trauma like if you cut yourself that's a stress to the body uh, if you have an emotion if you are thinking emotionally about somebody and you you, you just you don't even need to talk to them. It's the mere thoughts can be stressful, which is that was only discovered very recently that we can have a stress response based on thoughts alone, which makes uh, being a human uh, something quite cruel, I think, because we can we can not necessarily encounter something stressful physically, but mentally and emotionally, we can have the same stress response and it can do the same damage as if that person was still there. And the, uh, the physical stress, this is exercise or a cut or a burn, an injury, the stuff that happens physically on the body. The thing is with the stress system, it all goes down to the same level of cortisol output and, and a hormonal cascade, but it doesn't discriminate. So it's not like, oh, you, you go through this mental stress and you produce more cortisol. When you go through physical stress, you produce less cortisol or blunt cortisol. It's not how it works. Like the body just reads stress and then secretes cortisol. And this is really important because say if you are going from your hyper stressful job into your hyper stressful uh, exercise routine back home to your stressful environment, if you've got kids or um, even if you've got a partner that you're fighting with, that's just pumping out cortisol day in and day out. And we've done a little bit of reading and, and learning on cortisol. We know that uh, some of it is okay, but too much cortisol can lead to a hyper stressful state. And that's when we see the body break down. So the key thing to know here is the body does not discriminate. It can pump cortisol all day long. Uh, it doesn't matter what stresses we're, we're getting. So mental, emotional, physical, and environmental, we talked about this. Environmental is one that we're gonna talk a lot about today. And that's got, uh, think about environmental toxins, pollution, that's still creating a stress response in the body and that can create increased cortisol too. You stress and distress? Really important point, look at this girl, she's a bit upset. This one seems pretty happy, but working hard. And this is a good way to think about distress and eustress. So stress in itself is not good or bad. It's just the variations of it. So distress, this is where we think about the, the body having something happen to it that's, that's ultimately harmful and the body will break down. It doesn't like it. Whereas you stress, you can have something happen to the body, but the body's going to react and grow stronger. And uh, there's, a, there's a fine line between the two because one's going to help you get stronger and faster and fitter and healthier. This one's going to have you break down. Each stress is different for every person. Like I could be walking through Mumbai and be really distressed, whereas someone else can be walking through Mumbai and have, have a really pleasant experience. So everyone's different in the way they encounter stress. But one thing we do know about stress is that acute stress, so short term bouts of stress or, or stimulation or impact on the body is usually favorable. And this is seen in exercise, short-term exercise. It's seen in if we encounter something really fast and quick and we, we adapt to it. Whereas something like distress, this is usually defined as something that is longer reaching. We, we have a job that we don't like, a relationship we're not happy with, the stuff that just goes day in and day out and just nags at you. That's the stuff that is stressful and the stuff that we feel like we don't have control of. But by all means, short bursts of stress are actually very favorable for the body. Something to keep in mind. Examples of this, physiological stress. So physiological eustress, short bouts of exercise, perfect example. The body, yeah, it, it'll go through a stress response at the time, but ultimately it's gonna get stronger. 
distress, this is where we see breaking down. So this is chronic exercise where you don't give it the same amount of, re of recovery that it is needed in that we get with you stress. So we see this with people not focusing on their sleep, their nutrition. That is when the body starts breaking down through exercise and it can seriously happen. Mental and emotional, we've all been here. I would argue that short, resolvable arguments are a real necessity in life. I consider that a use stress. We actually grow stronger in our relationships through, resorting, uh, through resolving conflict. What is not good is letting that conflict lag and not resolving it. That's where we find distress. You stress in environmental short-term toxin exposure. There is some good evidence behind short-term toxin exposure. The body needs to be challenged in certain ways. Think of this like uh, heat therapy or cold therapy, or even as kids, we should, have it we should have exposure to the natural environment to stimulate the immune system to help it grow stronger. Where this comes into play, if we're exposed to toxins long term that, that are not beneficial for us, that's when we can see the body start breaking down. And that's, that's an easy one, but pollution long term could be a real issue. And the balance between the two is important. No stress, use stress, and distress. So this is a, a pendulum I drew up. Lethargy down here, boredom, contemplation. Yeah, these aren't too bad here. They're necessary in life. Well, they're all necessary in life. I think we, think we should go through a range of, of different moods to suit just the time of life that we're in. But really the gold standard is being a mix between use stress and distress. And this is where we're focused and stimulated. And I think we've all been in situations where we're stimulated, but like overstimulated, three coffees down. Yeah, yeah, we're stimulated, but are we actually focused and getting work done? Maybe not. We've also been in situations where we're bored and, um, and lethargic. Uh, we, we might be complete, we might be undergoing contemplation, but we're not actually stimulated enough to get stuff done. So I think the bulk of, um, well, the bulk of my coaching is getting clients back into this focus and stimulated zone. And that brings across homeostasis. So homeostasis, you would have heard this before. That's, think about being balanced in the body, the property of a system that regulates its own internal environment to maintain, to maintain a stable condition. Such a beautiful definition. And that goes into Nassim Taleb's um, idea of anti-fragile, having the body being able to withstand its own stresses to find an equilibrium. Uh, I think that's really cool. And it says something to, to our, our state to say, you know, whatever comes at me, I'm ultimately going to grow stronger from this. And I think that should be the goal of a lot of our training and a lot of our nutrition and lifestyle protocols is to build a more resilient structure. So you're able to withstand stress. Let's talk hormones. So hormones are like messengers in the body. Cortisol is our main stress hormone. We've talked about this before. It's a steroid hormone. It's an anti-inflammatory hormone. It aids in metabolism and is catabolic, breaks down. So steroid hormone is produced in the adrenal cortex. It goes up with the sun and down with the sun. So we're going to be producing the most of it when the sun is at its highest. Well, we produce most of it at about 10 o'clock ideally, but it goes up in the morning and then down in the PM. What we don't want is an altered cortisol rhythm where we have a, a spurt of it in the PM. We can't get to sleep. Cortisol works against melatonin. Uh, it's an antagonist. So it will, um, it will shunt melatonin production. So that's why we recommend having low exposure to light, particularly our laptops and screens at nighttime. So hopefully you're not watching this at night. And cortisol is really important. It helps us get through the day, but we want to be producing it at the right time. It's an anti-inflammatory. And a lot of people know this if you've watched sport before and the players, if they get injured and they want to come back on the ground, they'll get a cortisol booster or cortisone booster. It's the um, a, a byproduct of cortisol at half time to help them get through the, work, through the, um, through the game. And uh, it shuts down the immune system. So think about this. Have you ever got really sick after you've been stressed? The answer might be yes. When we go through something stressful, we're, we're producing cortisol. And this best example is with an exam, with a breakup, with a presentation you've got at work. The body will pump through cortisol to get you through that. It perceives it as stressful. Do we need that? Maybe. 
maybe we need those late nights and cortisol to be pumping through. The thing is, it's going to stop you from getting sick. It's very bloody clever. I think it's pretty cool. It'll mute white blood cells and um, lowers Sig A, which is an antibody responsible for uh, inflammation in the gut and digestion as well. Uh, what we ooh, lost my screen here. Sorry, guys. Bip. Back to cortisol. Yeah. Uh, so it shut down. It shuts down the uh, think of it like the sickness process. But once that cortisol wears off and the stressor goes away, that's when we decide to get sick. So having a prolonged cortisol response for a long period of time, it's going to come crashing down at some point. Metabolism so uh, raises blood sugar. Of course it does. We need to get through a stressful situation. The blood sugar is going to be high to help us get through. It will aid in glucose utilization. Uh, suppresses gastric em em emptying and um, our, our digestion is, is you know, like shut down or muted. I like the word muted because it really is, it's quietened. Digestion is not important because you've got stressful shit to deal with. Digestion is a part of the parasympathetic nervous system. We spoke about that earlier. You've got to save that for after the stress is done. The thing is digestion is important for our everyday life. So we need to get into that parasympathetic state if we're to be healthy. Catabolic. Cortisol is catabolic. It breaks down muscle tissue and organs. So um, you're not going to get super strong or super jacked if your cortisol is raised all the time. If that's any incentive to do some meditation, go for it. Over time, I love this chart. There's phases of HPA axis dysregulation or dysfunction. So this is homeostasis. We spoke about that before. This is when we can deal with the stresses and ideally the acute stresses that are coming our way. Cortisol is going up, but our body is responding. Cortisol is going down again. And this is going to grow us stronger over time. This green, very happy in there. And the yellow here, this is where we're faced with something. So we're faced with an acute stress. The cortisol goes up. It's a resistance phase. This is where we're doing the presentation or doing the exam or, or having a fight with your partner. This is where we uh, have a prolonged cortisol response with the idea that it's coming back down to the green. That's where we want it to go. You will not get sick up here. You might get sick here acutely, which isn't a bad thing. We should have immune reactions and get, and get sick sometimes. Up here, you won't. Cortisol is too high. If cortisol, eventually it will come down. This is where we see adaptation. And I love this phase of adaptation because this is usually where I see people where they're like, yeah, I, you know, I, I was feeling okay six months ago, 12 months ago, but I just don't feel the same anymore. And this is where people start looking for help, help in the form of a pre-workout, a caffeine drink, uh, some sort of training program to get them back into this yellow. Because guess what, this yellow, it feels good. When cortisol is high, it feels good. And it can be addictive and people get addicted to stress, but it's not optimal. Short bouts of stress, yes, fine. But just to prolong stress day in and day out, although it may feel good for some people, especially if they've got an addiction to stress, which does happen, then it's, uh, it will fall down at some point. And this is where I see people in this orange and, and red part here. And um, yeah, very common to, for the body to start breaking down. Because remember, the cortisol is worn off here. Cortisol is an anti-inflammatory, remember? So the cortisol is worn off, and that's where we're going to start getting sick. And we'll start compensating. The body starts compensating in other ways. It'll, it'll change our hormonal profile to produce more cortisol. It'll figure out ways to get through the stress. And that's not going to be a good thing. It's good that we got it there. It's good that we've got it as a compensatory mechanism but we don't want to be relying on compensatory mechanisms. That's like you relying on a coffee to get you through your workout or relying on a drug to enjoy music. You know, it, it, it can be fun for sometimes, but do we want that all the time? No, we want to rely on homeostasis and, and power and health within. Let's talk lab tests. So lab tests is something that I run for most of my clients particularly if they think they've got some hormonal stuff going on, we can look underneath the hood. So uh, this is the hormone test that I run. It's called the Dutch test. And this measures a whole bunch of hormones, but we're just going to look at cortisol today. So we have a cortisol rhythm here that is chronically low. So this is on the dial of the free cortisol, the stuff that's floating around the body ready to be used. And the metabolized cortisol is stuff that we're actually using really low on both ends. 
And if we go over here, we can see the cortisol pattern throughout the day. This person's taken four samples, waking cortisol, yeah, not too bad. In the red there, between the high and the low range, within range. So this person's waking up okay. But then they're just crashing for the rest of the day. So they've got a really low morning cortisol, quite low afternoon and quite low in the night. And overall, just, just super low throughout. So right away here, we're thinking, all right, we've got to deal with that stress a little bit more, but it's more than likely the person is uh, in the compensation phase. So down here, cortisol starting to wear off. They're not feeling like they were anymore and they're looking to get back up here. So what do we do in a situation like this to raise cortisol? First, we've got to manage our stresses and think about where we're producing cortisol over the day. It might be a case of introducing some meditation, uh, choosing different types of workouts, like workouts, high, high intensity workouts all the time may not be beneficial because they're more cortisol inducing. We're doing some walking instead or some slow steady state stuff instead, okay, more beneficial. Supplements can help this, food can help this as well. So we're gonna look at the whole picture. Uh, cortisol summary, so short bouts of cortisol, fine, cool, good. Exercise is the best way to think about it. But chronic cortisol, if we're stressed for a long period of time, it's when the body starts breaking down. Uh, Robert Sapolsky's work's been really good with this in humans and chimps. With, uh, with, with exposure to stress for long periods of time. Uh, we see memory loss, weight gain or weight loss, uh, pretty much a breakdown of the body, breakdown of cells. Uh, also, autoimmunity uh, can happen with, with the prolonged cortisol and um, glucocorticoid uh, exposure. Okay, let's talk testosterone now. And um, I'd rather facetiously put a fellow here who looks like he's all jacked up on testosterone. He probably is. Uh, because testosterone is largely thought of like the male hormone. Oh, that's what the big guys have. And yeah, true, they do. And um, but you do as well. Everyone's got testosterone, and it's equally as important for well, maybe not equally as important. It's important for everybody, uh, but it is considered a male hormone. Males will produce more of it than females, and it is a very important hormone. Muscle mass, fat loss, motivation, drive, mood is a big one with testosterone. If your testosterone is low, you're going to be having a really crap time. Like energy will be low, motivation will be low, and you just won't be able to get through your day. And I see this quite a bit in the people that I work with, and it's quite scary, in my opinion, because there are a lot of things that affect testosterone. One thing that's coming out now is the link between concussion and traumatic brain injury and testosterone. The reason being the, the hormone um, production shuts down from the brain and we stop producing testosterone and people just don't feel the same. They feel like a different human. Uh, and this is where things like testosterone replacement therapy become really useful in, in these sorts of cases and probably needs to be looked at a little bit more. But just like any hormone, too much of it can be problematic, too little, problem as well. But I'd argue too much is much better than too little with testosterone. The good and the bad. So I've uh, talked about the good, what it's good for. The bad depression is a big one with testosterone. So low testosterone will lead to depression. Uh, muscle mass, libido, uh, increasing body fat also. Uh, all these are associated with low testosterone. Also linked to a bunch of diseases. Estrogen is the partner hormone of testosterone. This is the more female version of the, um, of the hormone series. You've got... Testosterone and estrogen in both females and males, but estrogen is more of a female dominant hormone. Very important for energy, bone, hair growth, uh, sexual function, and muscle growth as well. There's good and bad. Uh, good, I've talked about in bad, or what we call estrogen dominance, where there's too much estrogen in the system and it's dominating other hormones that might balance it out. In women, we see breast swelling, tenderness. A lot of women will feel this around their cycle, uh, times in their cycle where they just feel really tender, which is normal, but just an excess of it where it's just super potent, that can be estrogen dominance. Irregular menstrual periods and irritability, headaches, weight gain, hair loss, all that stuff is associated with estrogen uh, dominance. In men, which we see as well, too much estrogen, not enough testosterone, all the factors that we see with low testosterone, all the bad stuff we want to avoid. You might be asking yourself, how do I manage my estrogen levels? And I'm gonna talk now about, well, the biggest one, xenoestrogens. And this is a, a big factor in today's environment and probably one that doesn't get talked about enough. 
Zeno refers to alien, an alien figure here. And these are estrogen-like compounds, so they're not just estrogen, but the body reads them as estrogen and they bind to estrogen receptors and that leads to estrogen dominance. Where do we find these? Bloody everywhere. Household cleaners, plastics like BPA, cosmetics, uh, sprays like car fresheners and toilet sprays and things like that that aren't, um, that, that uh, are packed with these chemicals that are considered xenoestrogens or, um, or phytoestrogens. And these can be very problematic for our health. And we're only seeing that now with the studies that are coming out, that people have had this toxin exposure and their pro hormonal profiles are just completely cooked. Not just me that's saying this, World Health Organization estimated that 4.9 million deaths and 86 million disability adjusted life years are attributed to environmental chemicals. Wow. We got to think about this more seriously because all this stuff is associated with all these syndromes here, diabetes, infertility is a big one. Autoimmunity is a big one as well. I've seen this with people when they've, um, when they've come in with hormonal profiles and they've had toxin exposure in the past, you can see it pop up. It's going into babies as well, guys. This is pretty scary stuff. When we, this study looked at um, newborns and the chemicals that went uh, from the fetal cord into newborns, 287 chemicals uh, and all the stuff we don't want, dioxins, uh, phytholates, pesticides, Teflon byproducts. And um, a lot of this stuff has been known to cause cancer in, hum in humans and or animals and it can affect the nervous system. So this is definitely an area of health we've got to look at, seriously look at. Pollution, yeah. Massive problem, commercial pollution, and just the scale of production now is so high, and it's, it's no wonder that, that we're coming down with these sorts of conditions. Uh, this is one from the study earlier that were found in the fetal cord. Where are they found? And I said, sorry, the end here, because this stuff is found everywhere. Water, normal water, I don't recommend drinking tap water. If you can get a filter, I really recommend doing that. Uh, pesticides, herbicides, Roundup that's used in a lot of our commercial agriculture in Australia. It's banned in a lot of countries in Europe now, Roundup, just the effect that it has on, um, on what we talked about earlier. Cleaning products, plastics, they're the big ones there, perfume, laundry, cosmetics, birth control pills as well. All this stuff is, um, is xenoestrogen uh, dominant and phytoestrogen dominant, and that's really going to mess things up. So. Uh, the reason I put this stuff in, like, yeah, it, it can be inconvenient, but you've got alternatives. You know, you've got alternatives to cosmetics, to laundry. Uh, you can do better with your water. You can do better with your plastics. We should be doing that for a bunch of reasons. But, um, you know, health aside, the environmental impact there and cleaning products, there's there's options now, which is, which is pretty exciting. There was a thought that this stuff was dose dependent, like, oh yeah, a little is okay, but a lot is a problem, but it doesn't seem to be the case. The studies have shown that uh, there's a there's an uh, effective dose that's, that's quite low for a lot of this stuff. And it's a case of just firstly, reducing your exposure and then cleaning up your detoxification so that you can get rid of the stuff that you're exposed to. Here's a client that I work with, uh, struggled to gain muscle, excess body fat, trouble sleeping, poor oxygen delivery, we're just tanking workouts a lot of the time. And this was, um, well, poor oxygen delivery, we need to look deeper and see why that might be happening. So we ran, ran some blood tests to start off with that revealed some stuff about oxygen particularly, but then on the Dutch test, we revealed that the hormones were really tanked. Uh, very high estrogen, very low testosterone. So no wonder he has a hard time uh, losing weight and gaining muscle because those hormones are just out of whack and we're actually producing estrogen down the wrong well we're detoxifying estrogen down the down the wrong pathway here this is the 4-OH pathway which can be problematic when it comes to dna damage uh, this could point towards the liver being dysfunctional too what we're looking to do here is to push down this green pathway the 2-OH pathway that's considered a healthier pathway to detoxify our estrogen products, where he's using this red pathway there. So that would be a first point of call, is to reducing your estrogen exposure, but then detoxifying it down the right level there. 
And um, of course, boosting your testosterone, you know, sleeping better, mm-hmm. eating better, this all helps. Like sleep is the biggest one for testosterone. If you fix your sleep, that can, that can, be the, that, that can change a lot of things. What can we do to improve our hormone production? So estrogen, testosterone, sleep I spoke about, whole food, stress management, smart exercise, supplementation. In terms of the nutrition, yeah, whole food diet, we should all be eating that. That doesn't mean a whole donut either. It means a whole food diet, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, meat, seafood. Things like zinc and selenium are going to help testosterone as well. We can find those in shellfish, organ meats. Um, You won't find a testosterone-friendly diet uh, with veganism. You just won't. I recommend, if you are doing veganism, that's cool. I recommend supplementing with a B vitamin, B6 and B12. Also zinc supplement can be good as well, especially if you're not feeling great. Also, if you're not feeling great, really consider your diet and then what you're taking in. Cruciferous vegetables. This is a big one. So these guys are known to help our detoxification uh, pathways, particularly this 2OH. So what I recommend is getting broccoli, kale, organic broccoli as well, uh, kale, spinach, uh, Swiss chard, collards, those sorts of stuff. They're packed with this cruciferous uh, stuff and that's going to help lo- uh, detoxify our estrogen by pumping your 2 h pathway. And protein. No surprises there. We should be getting plenty of protein in the diet. At a minimum, I recommend one gram per kilo of body weight. 1.6 is a good target to hit 1.6 grams per kilo of body weight. And a lot of my clients are on like two to 2.5 grams, if, um, particularly if fat loss is their, if it's their goal. What exercise people should be doing. So I recommend weight training, heavy reps, uh, sorry, heavy weights, uh, low repetitions, compound movements are great for hormone production and aerobic training. Aerobic doesn't mean like sweating your ass off and doing a hip class. It means, using oxygen, being able to keep a sustainable level and of output. And that can be like going for a row, a slow row, or even a slow walk is aerobic training. Daily movement as well, just keep moving, get sunshine, uh, work with the sun and the moon, work, with, work out when the sun's up, when the sun's down, relax. These lifestyle factors as well, sleep and sunshine, stress management, nature, so important if we can get into that at least once a week. And, you know, that, that needs to be something that we actually think about and take on. It's not like, oh, you should get in nature onto it because we won't do it. We'll, we'll stay inside and, and, you know, it's harder and harder to do this stuff now. But the more you can expose yourself and, and deliberately get yourself out into nature, the better you're going to feel. There are some supplements as well that will help hormones, but um, I'm not going to recommend any right here without seeing someone's test results. Hormones are all about balance, guys. And um, you can be high in something and low in another thing that's in balance, or you can be high in something, high in the other thing. That may not be a bad thing. Uh, you've got to look at the whole picture. Hormones take a whack in an increasing stimulating environment. Environmental toxins are disruptive to hormone production and development. We know that. And foods have a vital role to play for sure. And gut is important here. And I'm going to talk about that going from the gut into the hormones. Gut's probably for another seminar, but this is an exciting area that I am looking at here. So um, stress in the gut. We all know that the gut has a big impact on our stress levels and the stress has a big impact on our gut levels. If you have something really stressful that you just face with, you feel that queasy feeling in the gut pretty quickly, like "Mm, something's not right here. And this is a perfectly normal uh, sensation to have and it's triggered by the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve uh, sends 80% of its fibers go from the gut into the brain. Think about that for a tick. 80% of the fibers, the vagus nerve, go from the gut to the brain. This is why the gut is called a second brain. It's got information in there. It's got intelligence in there. And we need to keep that environment friendly and clean to send us the right information to our brain. So much of our hormones is actually produced in the gut. Serotonin being one of them. Melatonin, another one. Serotonin is a feel-good hormone. It helps us relax. People who are depressed, serotonin uh, can be... Uh, uh, well, people who are depressed take SSRIs, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and that helps boost serotonin along the synaptic cleft. But how much of that is caused by the gut 
being upset. We don't know, but we should definitely look at how healthy our gut is. The brain also sends signals to the gut. 20% of the fibers of vagus nerve is sent from the brain to the gut. That's going to control digestion as well. Oh, back to the, back to the gut, to the brain. So in terms of uh, satiety and satiation, we want those fibers to be strong and sending the right message. Otherwise, we'll just keep on eating. So uh, this is where uh, glucose control comes, comes into things with, um, with that message going from the gut to the brain. We want our brain to be getting the right message from the gut to make sure it's regulating your eating. Also, the vagus nerve will innovate digestion. We know that, spoke about that, but also the parasympathetic state. So if we're digesting food, we're probably in a parasympathetic state. So the stronger that vagus nerve connection is, the better it's gonna be. Back to the parasympathetic state. We spoke about this in terms of both the parasympathetic and sympathetic activity. We want them to be balanced, using them at specific times, not being too hot on one and cold on the other. We want both to be active and ready. Optimizing healing, nutrition, lifestyle, and exercise. We spoke about this earlier. I'm not going to go through all of these, but some big ones that I will talk about are just the lifestyle factors here, because this is what's going to help trigger a parasympathetic response, like meditation, breath work, sauna is great for this, walking, sunshine, uh, getting a massage is great for this, acupuncture is great for this, any sort of body work is good for this, sex is great for this, we all know that, if you do have sex, funny enough, sex in itself is a to, to get into a state, so to, to get an erection or uh, vaginal fluid to, to get into a sexual aroused state, then we need to have a, that's a parasympathetic response. So let's think about that. To get an erection is a parasympathetic response that requires blood flow to those areas to help the, um, to help us get into the state that we need to be. So this is where stress and erectile dysfunction really plays a part. If we're sympathetic dominant, if you're in a stress state a lot of the time, this is where we see erectile dysfunction. Why? Because the body can't get into a parasympathetic state. So some guys might know this when you're struggling to get things happening down there and you start panicking and thinking and it gets worse and you start panicking and thinking and it's this feedback loop and all of a sudden you're lost what you need to do is relax in the first place, get more parasympathetic and things will happen. And then the state of ejaculation, that ha that's more of a sympathetic response, which is pretty cool. So we need to be able to use both. <laughs> Very important to use both. There's a breathing exercise to do. That does us for today, guys. Uh, thanks a lot for tuning in. If you wanna join me for a breathing exercise, then um, stay on. But if you're done for today, that's all the information that's going to be given. If you've got any questions, please reach out. I'm available for coaching through these areas in fitness, nutrition, and lifestyle. And I'm working remotely at the moment. It's all around the world. But those who are hanging on the line, I to find a quiet spot. Ideally, you're seated. And we're going to do a little bit of breath work to finish off. And this breath work is designed to get you into a parasympathetic state. First of all, I want you to close your eyes. It's called an alternate nasal breath. I want you to cover your left nostril with your right index finger and breathe through your right nostril. Cover the right. Exhale to the left. Inhale left. Cover left. Exhale right. Inhale right. Cover. Exhale left. Our left, 
comma XLY. In how right, comma XL left. On here right now. In how X. How X. How and exhale. And just continue like that for as long as you feel is necessary. But thanks a lot for joining me, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll see you next time.